special honor guest. Yay. For those of you who are wondering why I'm standing up here and uh, opening this service instead of Pastor Bert, he is out of town this weekend. And uh, I have good news. He has tapped our wonderful music director, Christina Pinkston, Dr. Christina Pinkston, to be um, our special speaker today, so she'll be delivering uh, today's message. I'm here really mainly as the connector, because while Christina is indeed a superwoman, think how difficult it would be to fly from the piano to the organ to the pulpit. So if I can use a worldly example, and forgive me for that worldly example, I will be the Robin to her Batwoman. <laughs> Uh, it's really uplifting to see so many guests here, and uh, especially gratifying to see Shayla, Christina's lovely daughter, and her husband, Devon, who drove up today from Richmond. But what I'd like to do at this point is to ask all of our guests to please stand so we can give you a warm altar state welcome. Please stand. <laughs>
I'm sure you'll find this study to be compelling as well. Now, on the outreach front, uh, Bill and I are looking, up, looking at setting up an October date for a group from our church to serve dinner in the Union Mission Men's Shelter. Now, we would like to schedule this in uh, August or September, but just, you know, the count, the res our respective calendars seem to make it impossible. However, if there's anyone in the congregation who is interested in leading a team, see me or Bill after the service, and we would be glad to schedule it for you. Uh, and kind of walk you through all the details that are involved, which really aren't that much. So. And then I'm going to conclude with one very important acknowledgement. Today is Neil Winley's birthday. <laughs>
had him stop driving because he was going blind. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's how bad it was. So that was good way in, in the prayers. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else with any concerns? Um, Most of us were around for Rise Against Hunger, but one of us wasn't, and we've got him back with us today. So it's great to have Gary back with us, and we appreciate all the work you did for Rise Against Hunger.
and you may be seated. Yes, Gary took a trip. He wasn't here for a little bit. I think he went on the old ship of Zion. <laughs> and he's going to tell us about this beautiful hymn written by Thomas Dorsey. And I remind you, Thomas Dorsey is a black man who was a musician in the, uh, in the jazz world, blues world. But he also played for the church. He rejected, rejected at first. They didn't want the world to come into the sacred. But I remind you that he wrote the words to this hymn. And no, we too are believe. But you remember I told you about Thomas Dorsey, how he didn't really want to go to perform one evening. His wife's big pregnancy. But he went anyway. While he was there playing, and then he had his intermission, his wife gave birth, but she died. And later on that evening, his son died. And when he got that telegram message at that concert, he was devastated. He rushed home. But he found, being obedient to the spirits, he went to the camp, and he wrote that very evening, Precious Lord, take my hand. Well, today, Gary is going to tell us in this wonderfully soulful way about the ship of Zion. He's going to tell us a story, and he's been on this ship. Let's see if we can go with him. Okay, come on, Gary, let's do it. Thank you. 
but plants are scorched and they wither because they have no roots. Other seed fell on thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. So, yeah, call yourself a Christian. <laughs> so, you call yourself a Christian. Please bow your heads with me, I'm going to pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your awesome goodness, for your ever-abiding grace, your unfailing mercy, and your divine peace. Thank you, dear God, for allowing me, your vessel, this blessed opportunity to share your word, to teach your word, to explain your word. To all who will hear and be glad to receive it. Speak through me, dear Heavenly Father. May the words on my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Through your Son, Jesus, the Christ, our reigning Messiah, I pray, we pray, amen. So, you call yourself a Christian. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus speaks to us in parables. In fact, he tells seven parables. The farmer sowing seed, verses 3 through 23. The good seed and the tares, which is Satan's activity and deception against the children of the kingdom with false teachings and false prophets. Verses 23 and 24 through 30 in Matthew 13. Parable 3, the mustard seed. Parable 4, the leaven hidden in three measures of meal, as found in verse 33. Parable number 5, the treasure hidden in a field. Verse 44, the parable of the one pearl of great price. You'll find that in Matthew 13, 45. To 46. And the seventh parable, the net cast into the sea collects both the good and the bad. Verses 47 to 52 of Matthew 13. The disciples question Jesus, why do you speak to the people in parables? You'll see that in Matthew 13, 10. Jesus responds in verse 11 by saying, well actually he responds in verses 11 to 23, but I'm going to just break it down. In verse 11, he responds by saying, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, not to them. This is why he speaks to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. That's Matthew 13, 13. And in Matthew 13, 16, Jesus says, But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears, because they hear. In other words, and to be clear, those who are receptive to spiritual truth will understand these illustrations. To others, the parables are simply stories with no meaning. So what do you ask as a parable? Good question. According to the American Heritage Dictionary, a parable is, and I quote, a simple story that illustrates a moral or a religious lesson. In Boyd's Bible Dictionary, which I have in my library at home, it states a parable is, quote, an allegorical representation of something real in nature or human affairs from which a moral is drawn. Okay, well, in essence, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly message. A parable is heavenly in meaning and reveals the mysteries, the truths of the kingdom of heaven not previously declared. So, I tell you again, Matthew 13, 3b through 9, 
a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. So, some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they were withered because they had no roots. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. So other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Well, this parable, the farmer sowing the seed, is a metaphor. What is a metaphor? I teach my students the difference between a metaphor and a simile. And I'm not talking about a comparison using like or as. That's a simile. A comparison is something, is, is something that represents something else. Well, the seed, the seed represents the word of God. The seed represents the word of God. And in this case, sermons or the message that I'm giving to you, Sunday school lessons. The farmer is the deliverer of the word. The preacher, the messenger. The soil represents the field, the world, churchgoers, congregation. So the parable is in fact an extended metaphor. I'm going to explain to you why it's extended. There are four basic descriptions, which I will detail. So, <laughs> you call yourself a Christian. Hmm. Yes, I'm a Christian. I go to church. <laughs> I do Sunday school. I sing in the choir. Well, <laughs> I'm a trustee of the church. Yes, I am. I do read my Bible. So I try to be a good person. None of these, to be honest with you, makes me a Christian. One who's Christ-like in spirit, in thought, in speech, and in behavior. Genuinely so. So description number one, hard and soil. A farmer went out to sow the seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Hard and soil. What is a hard and soil? That represents so-called Christians, those who have a non-penetrating heart non-penetrating spirit, who are self-righteous, who can't be told anything, who think they know it all, who might have their arms crossed in disgust, Ugh, in boredom, or the closed-minded mentality, those who often have stout faces, who speak harsh tones. I already know this scripture. This ain't new to me. I've heard this message how many times? I'm so bored. Why don't the preacher just sit down and shut up already? Many of these so-called Christians tend to disagree with the pastor. They write. They complain. They gossip. They tend to be negative-minded. They try to run the church and the affairs. Their bitter attitude shows in their facial expressions and can be heard in the tone of their voice. These persons likely create problems for the pastor and the congregants rather than being a part of a positive resolve. Do you know anyone like this? Come to my glasses. Do you know anyone like this? I knew somebody like that and knew quite a few. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I lived there for 30 years of my life. There's one person, who I would love to say her name, but we just call her Mary. <laughs> I was in my early 20s. Many of you know by now that I have a happy spirit. Well, I walked into the sanctuary one morning before going up to the organ, because I was minister of music there. I said, good morning, Mrs. D. 
they quickly become too distracted with the ways of the world to let go of that. And they let go of that lifestyle to where they could have God to claim them entirely. Instead, they were distracted by the ways of the world. They go to bars and nightclubs, strip clubs. They love street life and all its entails. They are sexually promiscuous. They tell lies. They cheat. They rob. They steal. There is a difference between robbing and stealing. Did you know that? Stealing, you don't want to be caught. Robbing, give me your money. They tell lies, cheat, rob, steal. They gamble. They spread false rumors. They're selfish and self-centered. Greedy, full of pride and haughtiness. Yes, preoccupied soil. And then we have description number four. The fertile ground. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Fertile soil represents true Christians. This is fertile soil. My babies, my three daughters, gave this to me a year ago. It was only this big with three red tropical plants. Um, tropical plants. And now look at it. Fertile soil. That represents the true Christian. Their soil is rich with minerals and vitamins, which is the Word, the Holy Word, which is absorbed in them through close Bible reading daily. Careful Bible study, daily, earnest prayer, quiet meditation, and obedient application of the Holy Word in their life consistently. That's fertile soil. Their soil is deep, that is, their faith and trust in God is steadfast no matter what, no matter where, no matter when. Their soil encourages growth. Particularly by the soft, kind words, the selfless deeds, the Christ-like actions and behaviors of these Christians that the unsaved see and experience reliably and constantly, which might very well cause the unsaved to learn, to receive, and to join the joy of living for Christ. My daughter Shayla knows, we, when we lived in Columbus, Ohio, my girl was very small, but next door to us was my brother, whom I will always love, Ray Hashman Sr. Now, I didn't realize when I was already there first, but when his house was built and he moved in, his house next to mine, I'm right here, he's right there, I didn't know that he hated blacks, he hated anybody of color. He referred to people who looked like Sean, D1, Patricia, her family, Patricia, shared me as the N word. And I don't mean nice and I don't mean naughty. <laughs> Look at those. Okay, I didn't know that. Well, I was Christina. Good morning. See? We had a lot of snow in Ohio. And I had a snow throw. I was throwing the snow pssst, off of his yard and off of mine, too. I was always kind, always smiling. And I like to have my windows open and get that breeze. So I'm playing my violin or my clarinet or the organ or the piano. I had no idea that he would open his windows or sit outside on his deck to hear me play. And praise God, after observing my manner, my warmth, my kindness toward him and his family, he accepted Christ as his Savior. Amen. He no longer hated blacks. He was very protective of me. I say that because my daughter's father ran out when they were four, three, and one to move in with his mistress. So if something went wrong with the house, Ray, Christina, I got this. I got it, Christine. You've always told me, Christine. He gave his life to Christ and he loved me as a sister to the day he died. 
fertile soil Christians eagerly, wholeheartedly, willingly, sacrificially produce for the Lord, regardless of whatever hardships they face or limitations they might have in their walk for and uh, walk for and with Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. They love the Lord and it shows. And they don't have to try to make it evident. It automatically is. Their love, their faithfulness toward, their trust in God shows. So here you have it, four types of soil. Hardened, shallow, you see the box, preoccupied with the weeds, and fertile. Hardened, you can't tell them anything. They have an impenetrable spirit. The shallow, there's no depth for the word to sink in and take root. Preoccupied, it takes root, it grows, but then the thorns and the weeds, Satan and his persuasive tactics, choke out the life that once was. Life that once was. And the fertile, rich in the Holy Word, deeply rooted in an unwavering faith and trust of the Lord, promotes growth, life, to the lost via a distinctive, steady, and continuous Christ-like manner in speech and behavior. So, do you realize that three-fourths of those Christians are not going to make it in the glory? Did you know that? The hardened, the shallow, the preoccupied, they're not going to make it in the glory. The fertile will. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So you call yourself a Christian? He who has ears, let him hear. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share, teach, and explain the Holy Word. I pray that it fell on fertile soil. Open our hearts, Lord. Let us receive, and let us through our our speech, our behaviors, our thoughts, and our deeds. Prove ourselves to be fertile so that we can bring others to Christ. In the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. Amen. Okay, turn to hymn number 170. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Let's sing all three stanzas and repeat the chorus. Please stand. Thank you. 
question that I have, I just love to teach. Benediction, coming from Latin. Bene, meaning good, well. Dicto, or dictio, to say, meaning to speak. So the Latin word is benedicere, to speak well of, or benedictio, blessing. So along with me, please raise your hands to heaven and receive your blessing. You can do this every time the pastor is about to give the benediction. Receive your blessing. From Ephesians chapter 6, verses 23 and 24 in the Living Bible. May God give you peace. May God give peace to you, my Christian brothers and sisters, and love. With faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus the Christ. May God's grace and blessing be upon all who sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace. Go out singing, oh, how I love Jesus. <laughs>